I put this picture up to get started to satisfy my own guilt trip. Um, I'm going to talk about seven early women of the uh, Hill. And when I sat down afterwards, I thought, boy, I didn't even include John Meg's daughters. And I should have included the two of them because they did so much, but I wanted the other seven. So I thought I would start out with a picture um, of uh, John Meg's daughters. Um, Margaret Meg's Howard on the far side there, and uh, Mary Meg's Woods on this side. And Herman Hagedorn in the middle. Herman Hagedorn is the, uh, he graduated from the Hill in 1900, and he is the one that commissioned the painting of Mrs. John, John Meggs' wife. Um, and this is at the unveiling of that. Um, it was 1960 that this photo was taken. Um, so I wanted to start with uh, that just to uh, include them. Uh, what I did then, I sat down and tried to list women of the hill, and there were just so many that I could possibly talk about that I restricted it to pre-1951, when the hill celebrated the 100th anniversary. And I started making my uh, list of possible people, and this was the list of people that I came up with. Well, there's too many. So I chose seven, what I call my magnificent seven that we will talk about. <laughs> However, I want to mention a couple names here before we get started, uh, because you might recognize the uh, name and wonder if it's the same person. Um, Caroline Ballastier, Carrie Ballastier, um, and for the 1800s, I think it uh, was something a little unusual that someone kept their maiden name uh, but uh, Carrie Ballastier always used her maiden name, particularly because of her writing. Uh, I think she made a mistake. Uh, she should have used her married name, her post Pottstown name, and be known as Mrs. Rudyard Kipling. Oh. And she would have sold many more books. <laughs> um, uh, Beatrix Furan. Uh, we will mention uh, later on here, um, but she is the famous um, landscape architect. Um, we will touch on her a little later. Um, Anna Coleman Ladd uh, is the sculptor who did um, many of the works in both Boston and San Diego. Um, and she's also done a beautiful piece here at the Hill School. Um, we actually had, and just to keep it straight, um, two Mary Gould Meggs. Now, the mother I've written out is Mary Moulton Gould Meggs. Mary Moulton Gould married Matthew Meggs, the founder of the school. Um, I didn't want to list Mary Gould Meggs twice. Unfortunately, um, she went by the name Mary Gould, and unfortunately, she named their first daughter Mary Gould Meggs. So there's two Mary Gould Meggs. Uh, we will talk at some length about uh, Mary Gould. Um, in going through and studying the different people, I came up with an interesting fact. Mary Gould gave birth to twin daughters who, who died in infancy. Then I came across writing that Mary, 30 years later, gave birth to twin daughters who died in infancy. Um, to me, this somebody's made a mistake and gotten the two mixed up because they had the same name. That's next to impossible. Luckily, I got in contact with great, 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 great granddaughter of Mary, so five greats of Mary Gould. And she was in a genealogy, which was great, and it's true. They both had the twin daughters that they lost at a very young age. Um, Mrs. Alexander Hamilton Rice survived the Titanic. Her uh, son did not, and she gave both this building and the building next door um, the alumni building, 
uh, in memory of her son. Uh, and if you're from this area, you might know Alice E. Shepard. Uh, Dr. Shepard was the first female physician in Punkstown. She was the daughter of a uh, man that I'll mention several times today, um, George Q. Shepard, who taught math at the Hill for 47 years. And uh, he lived in Shepherd House, which was owned by him at that time. And even after he retired, he continued to work here in the um, admissions office. So I'm going to start with my seven. First one will be Sarah Mae Potts Hobart. Sarah Hobart, and it might sound a little unusual because that I include her. 1851 was the founding of the Hill School, and she died 25 years before that. So she never knew the Hill School existed, but she had a lot to do with the Hill School, believe it or not. Um, a little bit of history just to um, show this. Um, David Potts was the grandson of John Potts, the founder of Pottstown, and he owned all this property. 1793, he began building uh, his homestead on this property. It uh, didn't go well. Uh, he ran out of funds. He had some problems with the uh, water. And by 1795, work had ceased. Uh, it was only half done. It um, lay vacant. Uh, people in town called it Potts's Folly. They claimed that it was haunted. And after it lay vacant for a couple years, he sold the property, and obviously he wasn't going to sell it to just anybody. He sold it to Sarah and her husband, Robert. Sarah was his sister, and that's why he would sell it to her. And she was responsible for getting everything completed. And just to uh, get started, the one thing that I would really include Sarah for is this early painting, Sarah was an artist. And this is the original Hobart mansion that David Potts started. It's as if you were standing in the middle of the headmaster's garden um, now, looking towards where the Saunders room uh, is now. And this is the building. Obviously, this is before um, photography, uh, so that this is the only depiction we have of the campus before Matthew Meggs bought it. A um, couple of the other buildings I think we should uh, mention that was built by Robert and Sarah Hobart. On maps, this is listed as a stable. I don't think it was. I think it was a carriage house. Um, I think the horses were kept in the barn. Um, this building still exists. It is now the daycare center. It's been changed a little bit. Um, I don't think the, uh, the porch is not on there now. The uh, chimney has been taken off, and this top part has been taken off. But that is now the daycare, but that was built in 1793. Another building on the campus was the gardener's cottage. It stood um, <coughs> where the uh, wood shop is now. And this is a different stairway, not the one going down from the chapel now. This stairway was further down. It was wood uh, going down to the area below the chapel. But that was built at that time also. And the barn. Um, this stood where the... Um, um, the a swimming pool and Gillison Court are Sheridan Street that comes down from Beach Street used to come all the way down to uh, Chestnut intersect there um, by right in front of the Sweeney Gym so uh, this barn was on the corner of Sheridan and Chestnut uh, long interesting uh, story 
on finding that photo, <laughs> uh, which I don't have time to go into. I have been able to find a photo of every building that has ever existed on this campus. That was the last one uh, that I found. Did you buy it or did you? Uh... No, I found it. Uh, well, quickly, I had gone through everything in that room in the basement of the chapel, right. or in the basement of the library, right. <coughs> Our archives. except in one file drawer, uh, there were a lot of photographs from the 1990s thrown in. And I hadn't gone through there, and I was leaving one day and thought, I'm finished. I've looked at everything in this. And I thought, isn't it a shame uh, that I didn't want to stop and look at those photos from the 1990s. So I went back and sorted through them to look at all these photos. And there must have been 2,000 photos just thrown in. They weren't in any kind of order or anything. In the bottom, under all these photos, were 10 photos taken in 1910. One was the barn. It was the only one I had not had. Uh, Mary Gould was an unbelievable person. I should have said that uh, I picked seven people. I'm sure if we had 20 people picking seven to give a talk today, uh, none of the 20 would have the same seven. There would be variations. Uh, however, I would take bets Mary Gould would be on every list. Uh, she was an unbelievable person. The school would not have existed uh, without her. It would have folded um, before John Meigs ever got to come to take over for his uh, father. Um, Mary Gould um, basically ran the school. Um, Matthew Meigs, his idea was to find the school, hire the faculty, and they would run it. 1901, John Meigs is headmaster. Hill School is celebrating their 50th anniversary. And for this, um, he had asked one of the students, now a man who had graduated from the Hill in 1859, had been here for four years, and he asked if he would give a talk. And I would like to read to you a uh, two paragraphs from that talk. Now the talk was about the Hill School in the 1850s. Um, this is Louis Richards, uh, who graduated in 1859. I cannot refrain on this occasion from paying my personal tribute of respect and affection to the character and memory of that rarely gifted woman to whose fidelity to duty much of the success of this institution in its earlier years was attributable. I refer to the honored wife and indispensable helpmate of the principal, Mrs. Mary Gould Meigs. Here indeed I feel that I sound not merely my individual note of, of praise, but join rather the general chorus which swells from all those whom she charmed and quickened. Every department of the economy of the constantly shifting household felt the impulse of her all-pervading presence. Herself, the mother of a large family, she was in an important sense a mother to us all. In the solemn hour of evening prayer, she led the singing. Over the well-laden table, she recited with a dignity, dignity befitting a queen, endowed with an almost masculine degree of energy Never from mere weariness of a desire for personal diversion was she absent from her post of duty. A zealous worker in the church, a conspicuous ornament to the social circle, a sincere and timely friend, she was everywhere valued, admired, and beloved. Beautiful in her life's consecration of purpose, beautiful in the limits, even in death, her name and her image will abide with all who knew her so long as memory endures. Now, this is a student uh, that knew her as a student, and obviously one had become a um, friend of the uh, family. 
George Q. Shepard, who owned uh, what is now the Shepard House, um, taught here for 47 years. And George Q. Shepard wrote an awful lot for the bulletin. So I have a lot of things. And I like where I can get things um, about people uh, that, who actually knew them. And rather than read uh, something and give you my impression for what I read, I'd rather give you exactly what they said. And George Q. Shepard later wrote this in an alumni bulletin. Dr. Meigs had pronounced characteristics, was forceful and effective, inclined to be aristocratic and overbearing, and had a local reputation for learning beyond any other man who has been in this faculty. Mrs. Meigs was most efficient, practical, sweet, kindly, lovable. She was always pleading with her stricter husband for more cheer, kindliness, and happiness in the life of the school. Um, and I could go on with quite a few other uh, tributes that people had written about her. We saw the uh, building um, as Sarah Hobart wrote it, or painted it. Uh, this is taken from the High Street side, a drawing that uh, this drawing appeared in the 1858 catalog. Thank you, eBay. I got it from them. Uh, and actually, you probably have seen this um, um, drawing. Uh, it's usually on our uh, programs for right. commencement. Uh, this It doesn't show up too well here, but there's statuary around here that uh, Matthew Meggs had uh, put in, but that was the main building after Matthew Meggs uh, bought it. But he founded the school in 1851. They lived in this main building. He had added the part where the dining room and kitchen are now, not as much as it's there now, but uh, he added some to the building, but everything was in that building. He lived there. The students lived there, the classrooms were in there, everything was in that building. By 1855, he had had it. <laughs> he had let it out. <laughs> and he built another home called the cottage. The cottage that he built uh, was right outside the science room, between the library and the science room, this grass area out here. Uh, and his family moved out of the main building into the cottage. They were in there for three years, I guess. Mary Gould finally convinced him that he should be more a part of the school. And they should live with the students in the main building. And he agreed to it. 1858, our, um, 18, yeah, 1858, I guess it was. Um, they moved back to the main building. Matthew Meggs sold the cottage. No longer was part of the Hill School. He sold all the property from that roadway in front of the library all the way down to Green Street. He sold all this property off. Um, and moved back to the main building, where it didn't last very long. <laughs> By 1860, he went it out. <laughs> he built another home. He called West Mansion. This stood where the Dutch village is now. Mm -hmm. At that point, that was the far western edge of the campus. Um, I did not find any good pictures of um, West Mansion. It's kind of interesting. Um, thank you for Adobe Photoshop. <laughs> I found three or four different photos, and I sort of pieced together um, different parts. There was no good photo. There's a couple places where I wasn't just sure how to fix it. So about the only thing wrong with this, I either had to make up what was in there, 
or do something to cover it up. So there's a couple tree branches that weren't really there. I used to cover up something I didn't know what to do with. Uh, but uh, that is West Mansion. Matthew Meggs actually uh, moved there in 1860. Um, in 1876, uh, John Meggs took over as uh, headmaster of the school, but Matthew Meggs still owned the school, and he lived in uh, West Mansion. 1880, Matthew Meggs wanted to go back up to uh, New York State, where he had grown up, and he and Mary Gould moved up to uh, New York State, he sold the property. So Dutch Village, where the land where Dutch Village is up to, and he sold the property next to it, uh, so all the way up to the uh, tennis court was sold off. Um, the Hill School later in 1925 bought that house back, um, and Boyd Edwards, who was headmaster then, named it Founder's House. Um, in honor of Matthew Meggs, who had built it. When I put this photo together, I sent a copy up to Winnie and Dick O'Shaughnessy, because they were the last family to live in this house, uh, to make sure that I hadn't uh, gotten anything right. It was really funny, because first I get an email from Winnie uh, saying that this little window didn't exist, it wasn't there. And then the next day I got a letter back uh, Yes, Dick insists it was the head <laughs> shop. He remembers that window. Was it ever a dorm? Was it ever used as a dorm? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, from the time the school bought it back in 1925 uh, until it was demolished in 1967, okay. it was a dormitory. Okay. Um, John Banks. I can't say enough about John Meggs. I can go on. I think I spent two class periods um, last spring in Dr. Bender's class talking about John Meggs. He must have just been an unbelievable person. John Meggs never named anything for his father. And he stated that um, he never had a close relationship with his father. Um, he adored his mother. And it was a good thing that. Uh, he did. Uh, it's interesting that 1876, actually, he had an older brother, George, known to the students as Mr. George, because there were so many Mr. Megs around. <laughs> Mr. George um, actually was running the school. Um, Matthew Megs owned it and had the name of headmaster. But I found writings in students' uh, diaries where they thought of Mr. George as the headmaster. And Matthew Meggs as the owner. 1876, George Meggs' wife suddenly died. He had a nervous breakdown, and he wasn't going to be able to continue running the school. Mary Gould writes to John, not Matthew. Mary Gould writes and states, George is unable to continue running the school and your father is incapable of running the school. <laughs> you have to come home and take over, or it'll have to be closed. I give the father credit. I think if he had written the letter, John might not have come back. He was all set. He knew what he wanted. He was going to be a professor. He was a professor at Lafayette at the time. And uh, he really loved it and wanted to do it. When the chapel was open in 1904, John Meggs gave the organ. And he named it in memory of his mother. And there is this plaque. Uh, the wording on the plaque, you can't see it there. Mother, comforter, friend, in strength, gentle, in love, selfless, in service, tireless, in patience, joyous, her children rise up and call her blessed. Marion Butler Meggs, known as Mrs. John. While John Meggs was at uh, Lafayette, um, he became very close friends with a professor, Rossiter Raymond, and his wife. 
Uh, this was a uh, very close relationship. They were probably by far his best friends, non-family uh, in his life. Uh, in fact, he always called them Uncle Ross and Aunt Sally. Uh, and he stayed in close touch with them when he came back to the Hill School to be the uh, headmaster. In fact, they had a young son who was only about four years old when John Meigs was a student at Lafayette and first met this young son, uh, Dwight. Uh, Dwight was an invalid, and he just impressed John Meigs so much. Here was a kid who was always joyful, happy, and everything, and he had reason to be sad. He had just impressed, and they really got along so well. Um, Mrs. Raymond liked to tell the uh, story that one time she was uh, talking with her kids and she asked the question, who who has ever lived do you think is most like God? And little Dwight says, Mr. Meggs. <laughs> <laughs> Later that uh, afternoon she overheard uh, the little boy's sisters kidding him about giving that answer and his reply was mother says Jesus I say Mr. Max the Raymond family had friends coming to visit from Connecticut. And they invited John Meggs. They wanted him to come and visit these friends. He was not told that they were bringing their 22-year-old daughter who had just graduated from college. <coughs> Marion uh, Butler <coughs> and John Meggs evidently hit it off immediately. Um, they, she was just leaving for two years in Germany uh, to study music. He made many trips in those next two years to Germany. And in 1882, he went over for her graduation, and on June 1st of that year in Germany, they were married. They spent the summer traveling Europe as their honeymoon. Got back here in time to start school. Uh, I should add there, first and only son he named Dwight Raymond Meggs in honor of the little boy who he had known. The little boy had died as a teenager. Uh, but um, he had asked uh, the Raymonds if he could use that name. I give Marion Meggs, Mrs. John, as everybody called her, uh, much credit for um, information that I've been able to get. Mrs. John was a saver. She saved everything. <laughs> and she was a letter writer, as was John Meggs. It's interesting that those two, any night that they were not together, if one of them was off campus on a trip or anything, before going to bed, they wrote letters to each other on what happened that day. I don't know what happened with most of her letters to John Meggs, but she saved the letters uh, to her from John. And particularly, the ones that I found very informative was when he was on campus and she was away, and he would explain the events of the day, everything that happened. 1946, when she passed away, um, Margaret uh, Meggs Howard, her oldest daughter, took all these letters and threw them in a box and gave them to the old school. About two years ago, I came across that box. I don't think it had been opened since 1946. And I went through all those letters. She even had in there the love letters that he sent to her when she was in Germany 
Uh, there were all kinds of things in that uh, box and a lot of information. But as I said, the most informative were the ones written to her when she was off campus. I, we saw at the very beginning the painting of Mrs. John. That was done after she had passed away. That painting was uh, made by, from this uh, photograph of uh, Mrs. John. There's another um, painting. I should add that that um, painting that we saw of Mrs. John at the very beginning uh, was lost in the fire in 1973. Uh, this painting is not owned by the Hill School. It's Mrs. John at the piano organ. Um, it was uh, painted by William Merritt Chase in 1883 at uh, their summer place, Seven Pines, up on Lake George. Uh, uh, Mr. Chase was a friend of the family. Uh, but this painting, I believe right now, is in a museum someplace in the Midwest. Mrs. John came back here in 1882, and she was a part of the Hill School right away. She is responsible for creating the Hill School Choir, the Hill School Orchestra, the Dramatics Club, the Record, the Literary Magazine, Bethany Mission, uh, which was uh, a place where students volunteered to do work for people in Pottstown and help out people. It um, stood where the Ricketts Center is right now just up on uh, Beach Street. Uh, when uh, that was finally uh, ended, after she no longer ran it, the, uh, it was torn down and the property was given to Pottstown. And they built uh, the Ricketts Center there then. She also started the policy, if a student was dismissed from the Hill School, the last thing that he had before leaving campus was a meeting with her in what was called the sky parlor at the very top of the main building. And she emphasized a point which we use today, we still follow pretty much today, that a student dismissed from the Hill School is still a part of the Hill School and can be a member of the Alumni Association. That they did something wrong, but uh, they will forever be a part of the Hill School. Uh, Mrs. John also created the Hill School. Well, no, skip. Created the Hill School Crest. Uh, what she wanted was she wanted something that showed a large hill. She wanted a shield for defense. She wanted a sword for offense, and she insisted that the sword have a cross for a handle to lead into battle. And she wanted a sunburst for light. And then Mr. Roth added the motto, whatsoever things are true, uh, to it. So we have that. Uh, Mrs. John also was a terrific speaker, public speaker. And I have found more writings about one talk that she gave, and several people who happened to be there as students said it was the greatest talk that they had ever heard. John Meigs died suddenly on a Monday evening. She asked to speak to the school, in the schoolroom, on Tuesday evening. And she, this was restricted to Hill School students and any faculty member who was a Hill School graduate. And she gave a beautiful, moving speech. Um, it was just unbelievable. If I ever get a book printed, that speech will be pretty much uh, in there because it's just unbelievable what she was able to accomplish uh, for those kids with that uh, speech. Here's one of my favorites. Elsie DeHart Slaughter. Um, 
You will not find Elsie's name in the John Meggs book written in 1917. You will not find Elsie's name in the uh, History of the Hill written by Paul Chancellor in 1970. You can see here I was unable to find the date when she was born. What happened here was the basement of the uh, library, I came across a stock certificate. John Meggs didn't have any money to do the building and everything that he wanted to do. So what he did was he sold stock in the Hill School, but he restricted it to fac select faculty and family members. I came across this stock certificate and several others, but the others were names Sweeney and Roth and Shepard, uh, you knew them. Uh, Mrs. John, Mrs. John's brother. Um, you know, I knew all those. It was one Elsie Slaughter. I had to find out who this was. I knew she was not a faculty member. My first thought was that maybe Mrs. John's sister or something like that. Mrs. John had no living sisters. Her sister died uh, as a teenager. Uh, let me pass that stock certificate around. At the same time, I'm going to pass just a couple um, postcards around. One, thank you, eBay, a postcard sent in 1906, sent and signed by Elsie. <laughs> Got it on eBay. And the other is just an interesting uh, early photo of the showing the front of the Hill School. I'll pass that around. Well, I asked around whether anybody knew the name Elsie Slaughter. Nobody knew. I couldn't find anything about Elsie Slaughter. Until finally one day I was having lunch with Dick Foles, who worked for about 40 years. In the, from, he started in the 1950s working at the um, business office. And he said, yes, I know that name, Elsie D. Slaughter. She was an employee of the Hill School. That's all I know. <laughs> Okay, well at least that gave me a start. Right. Then at the Hillbackers meeting, the organization of uh, former employees of the Hill School that still have a great love for the Hill School, I asked them one day, Dolores Corn, who had been a secretary here, said, oh yes, she was a secretary in the headmaster's office. Uh, she said, I never knew her. She retired before I came to the Hill. Well, what year did you come to the Hill? 1946. Okay, that narrows it down a little more. Got the bright idea of calling Mrs. Jameson, who was the headmaster secretary when I came to the Hill School in 1970. And all I knew about Mrs. Jameson was she had been here forever. <laughs> so I thought, well, she worked in the headmaster's office. Maybe Mrs. Jameson would know her. So I called Mrs. Jameson. I'll never forget her reaction. First thing. Did I know Elsie Slaughter? <laughs> she hired me in 1936. Oh, wow. Elsie Slaughter, John Meggs, never had a secretary in his early years as a headmaster. John Meggs was the headmaster, the school treasurer, uh, the registrar, the disciplinarian. He did everything. And according to George Q. Shepard, he also taught the normal number of classes that all the other faculty taught. How he did, I don't know. By 1892, he realized he had a secretary. He needed a secretary, and he hired Elsie. Elsie then retired in... <laughs> one, one thing, at that time, I had no dates whatsoever on Elsie. And the one thing I wanted to get a hold of uh, was an obituary that maybe I could get information. So I asked Mrs. Jameson, she had no idea when she had died or anything, and I said, well, did you go to the funeral? Yes. I said, well, where is she buried? Mount Zion. So I go out to Mount Zion uh, and go to the office, and they gave me an area about the size of a football field, and she was someplace buried in there, and I found it. Yes. No of course, dates of course. on the stone. Of course. Oh, no. I go back to the office and bless them. They're, boy, they couldn't have been nicer. And they said, well, we can't tell you uh, when she died, but we could tell you when she was buried. 
but great. That's, that gets it close enough that going through newspapers. I'm not going through years and years of newspapers um, to find this. And then they looked at me and said, would you like a copy of all the records we have about her? I said, sure. So they made all these copies so I could know who bought the plot, who else was buried in that plot, and so forth. Um, then I went to the uh, library, and I found the obituary, and it said nothing, really. It listed six pallbearers, though. <laughs> uh, Jazz I Wendell, uh, Bob Copperthwaite, Larry Weehan, uh, Bill Bell. Uh, they were all deceased faculty members, except for one I didn't recognize. Harry Crush, C-H-R-U-S-C-H, -S -S which I've learned is pronounced Crush. I had no idea who Harry Crush was, so I was hoping maybe he wasn't Hill School related. Maybe he was a very young man, and maybe he would still be living um, if he was a pallbearer in 1956. I go through the telephone directory, and living in Sanatoga, which is where Elsie lived was a Harry Crush. Oh, I know Harry. You knew Harry? I got, about, I got a hold of him about two months before he died. Oh. I called Harry and explained who I was, what I was doing, and his only reaction was, well, yes, I am that person, but you're not the one I want to talk, you want to talk to. You want to talk to my wife. And then I hear this, Mary, somebody <laughs> wants to talk to you. So Mary comes to the phone, and she was just fantastic. Here's a good story on the Hill School being a family school. What happened was, when after Elsie retired, uh, she had diabetes, and she became blind. Bill Bell, in the, uh, as the business manager, taking care of Elsie, he hired a caregiver to go and take care of Elsie. She, this caregiver would spend about three hours a day um, to be with Elsie, cook the main meal of the day, and to do any house cleaning and so forth for her. The caregiver was Mary Crush. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, wow. And Mary had a lot of uh, neat stories. And I remember one thing she, um, I asked her about any stories that uh, Elsie would have told her. And she said, you know, Elsie didn't say too much about the Hill School, except she would go on and on about John Meggs and what a great man he was. Um, but uh, that was uh, about uh, all she would... Uh, talk about at the uh, Hill School. Um, when Elsie died in 1956, Elsie never married. Uh, she had an older brother and sister who lived with her for many years who had died in the early 1940s. Um, but she did have um, two, uh, they were twin nieces that she was close to. And she left her estate to be divided by the twin nieces and the Hill School. Um, I say Elsie helped me, and I want to go back to one more uh, thing. We've mentioned the John Meggs book, The Master of the Hill. There are many copies of The Master of the Hill around, but not as good as this one. <laughs> this one has more information in it than all the other copies. Why? Because this was Elsie's. 1917, when this book came out, um, that was Elsie's 25th year at the Hill, and Mrs. John beautifully inscribed Elsie. But Elsie, and I'm not going to pass this around because it's she's obviously used it over and over again. It's in pretty bad shape. But she has clipped in lots of photos, put in letters, newspaper articles. It is filled with all kinds of things. And I didn't think it was right to take them out of here. They belong in Elsie's filing system of this book. She has written little notes in here. 
things that she thought should have been in the book but weren't. Uh, one of the things in here, uh, when uh, John Meigs died in 1911, he was to be buried originally, the plans were in Edgewood Cemetery, not in the chapel. And in the John Meigs book states, a friend of the family wrote to Mrs. John a letter stating that um, he should be buried in the Hill School Chapel. A beautifully written letter, although it's not in that book. I found the letter actually, um, Russell Bowie included the entire letter in his autobiography that he wrote in 1960, but again, did not give the name of the person. So the person's name is nowhere to be found, except in this copy, but the guy's name was Roy H. Jones. And Roy H. Jones was a second year faculty member at the Hill School at that time. And he only stayed for about two years after, so I don't know much more about him other than his name. And I only know his name because Elsie gave it to me. Uh, she has written that in, in her handwriting, in the margin of the book. Oh. The only photos, this was Mary Gould uh, that I had up here earlier. Only photos that Hill School had of Mary Gould uh, were two photos with a group of about 20 students. No individual photos like this. Guess where I got this photo? Elsie <laughs> gave me this photo. I had read about the plaque and everything. And this plaque has an interesting story too. Um, it was put up in 1904, it was taken down in 1926 when the um, chapel was refinished and not put back up. And when I checked around about that plaque, and I, nobody had seen it, nobody had heard about it, they had no idea where it was. Um, I couldn't believe it, but one day um, I had asked Craig Strunk if I could just rummage through the attic of the maintenance building. And believe it or not, under a bunch of boxes and stuff, I found that plaque. It was um, pretty dirty and so forth, and with the gold leaf, I was afraid to try to rub it and clean it, but I figured, well, Ellen Nelson would know how to take care of that. So I got a hold of her, and we have it all cleaned up, and um, we decided now it's hanging in the uh, Hutton Cottage out here in the chaplain's office. Um, so if you get a chance to stop in there, you can see that the door is open. So it, can see good. It. it hangs in there um, right now. The one thing I did not know is where it actually was in the chapel, because it was the only plaque when the chapel first opened in the chapel. But you can tell from this photo that it's under the organ pipes uh, there near the front of the chapel. Alice W. Emerson. Uh, I have to list, she was the first full-time female faculty member at the Hill School. I don't have her exact date. She was at the Hill School from 1912 to 1936. She was the head librarian. Uh, so she was the librarian when the library was in middle school where the business office was, and then moved it over to the, where the current library is. She must have been a fantastic person. She wrote regularly for the Alumni Bulletin and uh, some fantastic uh, pieces of uh, writing. And in some of the student uh, journals down uh, stairs uh, there, um, they mentioned her. <laughs> um, a couple of them had in there about, they'd go into the library and the first thing she would say you have to go wash your hands before you touch one of my books. Uh, uh, but uh, she, uh, she had a story in one of the alumni uh, magazines, kind of. She and Mr. Roth sort of had this running fun battle. Um, but Mr. Roth evidently called her one day from his apartment in middle school, which was, what, 20 feet from the library, and he wanted four books, could she get them ready for him? He needed them for his class. Was, sure, fine. She claims he ran from his apartment to there, and 
as Mr. Roth always did in a very loud voice to disturb the whole library. Couldn't believe she didn't have his books ready yet. Um, and he always made fun that she did nothing but just check books in and out. Uh, she wrote one time that, uh, and you can imagine a librarian like that, very punctual, everything just so. And one day she got a telephone call. She had about a minute to get to the dining room to head her table. And she ran. She didn't make it in time. Grace was being set. And so she had to wait in the cloisters until after to walk in so that all the students could see she was late to lunch. And this just horrified her. But she insisted, since Mr. Roth was in charge of the dining room that day, he saw that she wasn't yet at her table. And he said grace one minute early. <laughs> Um, he also wrote, um, and I'm sure with tongue in cheek, and I can just imagine Mr. Wolf sitting there um, with this big smile on his face as he writes this in the alumni magazine as if Miss Emerson were talking. Sit down, write down here, and I'll tell you what has to be done with every new book. In the first place, it is disinfected. Next, I read it through very carefully in order that I may write to the author about the punctuation, which is perfectly disgraceful. <laughs> then I write in it with invisible ink. Next, the label must be pasted in with all that that implies. Then it is cataloged under four different heads, x-rayed, and a cross-section made. Then it is set away to cool and harden. <laughs> Mr. Roth's writings are unbelievable. If you get a chance to read some of his stuff, it's Unbelievable. He must have been another. I, I would list him as probably the greatest uh, faculty member ever at the Hill School. And he was here for 52 years teaching at the Hill. And I think um, Jazai Wendell, uh, Mr. Roth died in June of 1942. And that September, with all the new boys who didn't know Mr. Roth, the very first chapel meeting, uh, Mr. Wendell was trying to describe to them what Mr. Rolfe was like and everything. And I think he hit it with one sentence. And he could have just said the one sentence and he had it. He went on and on. But he said, every school has a Mr. Chips. Few have a Mr. Rolfe. No. Uh, which said it all. <laughs> Helen Corny Warden Clarence Warden graduated in 1893, and in 1920, when the alumni took over the Hill School, he was chosen as the first uh, chairman of the Board of Trustees. So his wife, Mrs. Warden, at that time, had two boys in the school. She became very close to many of the boys. She was very popular among the boys. Um, um, and the class of 1921, her oldest son's class, devoted two uh, pages of the yearbook to her. This One of the pages was this photo. Mm -hmm. And then the other page was writing about her. And uh, she was so taken by this, she was looking for a way to say thank you. Her other son was in the class of 22, and she had the way. She had a friend. I mentioned her friend's name earlier, Beatrix Ferran, who was an architect uh, mainly for gardens. Uh, she had done the Rose Garden in Washington. She had done the President's Gardens at Princeton and Stanford. She had done the gardens at the John D. Rockefeller estate. Um, I'll pass this book around. In here, um, on the page that has the um, paper in it, is the diagram for the headmaster's garden at the Hill School. And so she donated the headmaster's garden at the uh, Hill School. I wanted to show you on this um, the main building. This one 
of the things I like about this picture, the first flagpole was atop of that main building. There's very few pictures with a flag actually flying on that pole. Uh, but this shows you before uh, the garden was put in. It was just a grass area out in front there. In fact, in Matthew makes time, that grass area in front of this building was the only playing fields that the uh, kids had. Last person, uh, Marjorie Potts Wendell, Marnie, one of the Potts sisters. And this is not a misprint on dates. No, is that not. is right. <laughs> Uh, in that old Meg's house, there was a painting that hung there. This was the first sitting room. And I can remember uh, my first time ever on the Hill School campus in 1970. I was met at the door by Horace, who was the doorman. And he put me down in that room, and I was sitting there waiting for Mr. Montgomery and uh, wondering, I wonder who that woman is, not knowing that as years would go by, I would actually get to meet her. Uh, but Mrs. Uh, Wendell, Marnie, uh, followed along. She was good friends. She lived right next door to Mrs. John for many years. And she followed in helping others. Uh, I think probably her greatest achievement at the Hill, there was an organization before uh, her of the uh, women of the Hill, um, but it was a little loosely organized, and they really didn't have the money to do the charitable work that they wanted to do. 1930, when this building was built, meant that the basement of middle school, where all the science labs were, was becoming vacant. And she had the idea that they could build a student grill. And faculty-wise, where the women of the Hill would run it as volunteers, and so they could make money. So before that, this organization was making usually between three and five hundred dollars a year with uh, big sales and stuff like that. Uh, all of a sudden, they were in the three to five thousand dollar range and could do something and with, for different uh, organizations. She also was the founder of the uh, Pottstown Historical Society, and I think one of the reasons they have been so good to me. Um, and letting me just go through all the things they have down there. They just let me sit there and go through the files. Um, is because I'm from the Hill School and Barney was the founder of their organization. She was the big push in uh, 1952 of having a history of Pottstown written. Um, and uh, they made 300 hardback copies and 3,000 paperback copies. Again, this is not an ordinary copy. Thank you, eBay. This is Marty's copy. And it was on eBay. And she obviously knew Elsie because she has filed in newspaper clippings and stuff um, within this uh, book. I'll pass that around. Um, to finish up, we've come full circle. I want to come back to the painting by Sarah Hobart, Sarah Potts Hobart, she was a Potts. Maureen Wendell was a Potts. This painting was handed down through the Potts family and eventually into the hands of Maureen Wendell. Uh, after Jazz Eye had died, Maureen was, Maureen was living outside of town here, but she spent the summers up in New Hampshire. One of the summers in the late 1970s, her house was robbed and this painting was taken. We have no idea where it is now. So I'll finish with where we started, um, the main building. I should add, just in case uh, you didn't know, the uh, stonework of the current um, Saunders room uh, up there is the original stone from the 1793 building. Those, the outside stones were reused. 
They were taken down and reused. Well, this is just this a bad, was a great thing. Well, certainly, I enjoyed oh, it. Oh my Thank gosh. You. I